The 17 News at Sunrise podcast is brought to you by Clinica Sierra Vista. Welcome back to the 17 News at Sunrise podcast, where we share your news on your schedule. Working in the spirit of the Golden Empire, this is 17 News at Sunrise. And good morning. It is 5 a.m. on this Wednesday morning. I'm Alex Fisher alongside Chris Burton. Maddie Jansen has the day off. We 503 is our time now. And this morning we continue to cover that breaking news out of Los Angeles where two police officers were shot and killed in the line of duty. New video from overnight shows the police procession as the officers' bodies were taken from the hospital to the county coroner's office. And you can see the enormous amount of support from multiple agencies from around the area. Witnesses say the two officers never stood a chance, coming under fire from the suspect almost immediately. Officials call it an ambush. The shooting happened just before 5 o'clock last night. Investigators say the officers were responding to a domestic violence call and possible stabbing at the Siesta Inn in El Monte. Police say officers confronted the suspect and there were two exchanges of gunfire, one inside a motel room and a second in the motel parking lot. The two wounded officers were rushed to L.A. County USC Medical Center, but they did not survive. As soon as they pulled up right here past the motel, instantly shots were fired. Heard about five shots. I saw two police officers run around their car and, you know, sliding on the ground, trying to get cover. And yeah, after that, when I exited my vehicle and I looked out, uh, there was one man on the floor. The suspect was also shot and killed. Officials say the officers were well known in the community. One was a 22 year veteran and the other a rookie with less than a year on the force. Meantime, we're learning more about a shooting Monday night that left a CHP officer critically wounded. This morning, we're learning the suspect is a war veteran and was captured some 12 hours after the incident. Sandra Mitchell of our sister station KTLA in Los Angeles has more. A bloody trail down the hall and on the doorknob at this Van Nuys building. It is now evidence against the man accused of shooting a CHP officer Monday night. Neighbors say the suspect first came home to his apartment, followed by police. Real loud as it is, right above my head. We also spoke with the family of suspect 33-year-old Peshman Khazrabadi, a Marine who served in Asia and Afghanistan. His family says he returned from war with mental health issues. Outbursts, a little bit, anger, just typical PTSD. He needs help. <laughs> Last night, after a traffic stop in Studio City, investigators say Kashrabadi shot and critically wounded the 27-year-old officer. After a massive manhunt using bloodhounds, the suspected gunman was found earlier today hiding in a homeless encampment in Van Nuys. He was taken to the hospital to be treated for a hand injury and will be charged with attempted murder of a peace officer. The officer also is recovering, apparently shot several times in the face. Our officer right now is in critical and stable condition. So he's doing well. The CHP has released very little information about their injured officer, but the suspect's family says they are hoping he recovers. Oh, I just want to say that I'm so sorry. And um, my family and I are, are grieving as well. And we hope that you are safe and that you're well. 5.06 is our time now, and we are learning more this morning about a 71-year-old man allegedly killed by his son in southwest Bakersfield. Sheriff's deputies were called to South Real Road near Terrace Way around 5 a.m. Monday. There, they found Richard Alvarez Jr. with a stab wound. He died at the scene. Officials said the victim's son, identified as 38-year-old Daniel Alvarez, was detained in connection to the killing. The victim's granddaughter, tells 17 News, Richard Alvarez broke barriers at Bakersfield High School as the first wrestler to take home three Valley Championships. He was inducted to the BHS Hall of Fame this year. She says Daniel Alvarez was severely mentally ill and battled schizophrenia, adding he loved his father and needed help. Daniel Alvarez is due in court today. And a reminder, if you or anyone you know is struggling with mental health, you can call the Current Behavioral Health Crisis Hotline. That number is 1-800-991-5272. 
And now to your 17 court watch this morning. Convicted rapist, rapist Sergio Venegas has been ordered to stand trial on charges. He kidnapped and attempted to sexually assault a woman walking alone at night on Ming Avenue. On the night of May 2nd, a woman reported she was walking home when a man appeared from behind an electrical transformer, dragged her behind bushes and attempted to sexually assault her while threatening her with a knife. She managed to fight him off and get away. Venegas stole the woman's Apple Watch, which was used to track him down and arrest him, according to court records. Labeled the supermarket rapist, Venegas was suspected but never charged in five rapes that occurred in 1998 and 1989, where women at were attacked while walking alone in grocery store parking lots. Meantime, a man was sentenced to 25 years to life for kidnapping and raping his girlfriend over a period of several days in November. Prosecutors say the victim's sister became concerned when she didn't hear from her and filed a missing persons report. 27-year-old Martin Casares was located in Santa Barbara with the victim. Court records say he had visible injuries from a beating that occurred 10 days earlier. The jury convicted Casares of two counts of rape with the use of a deadly weapon, kidnapping, and making criminal threats. You can read more on this story on our website, KGET.com. 509 your time now. The Bakersfield Police Department is asking for the community's help in finding three missing people, two of them teens. This is a photo of 14-year-old Jacob Medina. He was last seen earlier today in the 1000 block of Kentucky Street. He's considered at risk because he has no prior history of running away. He's described at 6 feet tall, 140 pounds, with black hair and brown eyes. When he disappeared, he was wearing a black t-shirt, black pants, and white and black Nike shoes. Police are also looking for 17-year-old Sherry Ann Wolf. She was last seen Monday around 2 p.m. in the 3200 block of Sierra Meadows Drive. Wolf is considered at risk due to a medical condition and has not run away before. Wolf is 5'1", 155 pounds with black hair and brown eyes. Police say she was wearing a gray sweatshirt, blue denim shorts, and black shoes. And finally, police are looking for this 61-year-old man considered at risk due to a medical condition. This is a photo of Shamsher Loyal. He was last seen walking eastbound in the 3200 block of McKee Road around 10.30 yesterday morning. Loyal is 6'2 and was wearing a gray jacket and gray pajama pants. Anyone with information on any of these missing people should call Bakersfield Police at number 327-7111. Now to the latest on the COVID-19 pandemic and an FDA advisory committee is set to meet once again today to discuss the use of COVID-19 vaccines in children as young as six months. Moderna's shot is currently only authorized for adults, but the panel endorsed the vaccine for children 6 to 17. Now, keep in mind that COVID vaccines currently have emergency use authorization for children. This morning, advisors will also consider extending the authorization to kids as young as six months for both Moderna and Pfizer's vaccines. FDA documents released this weekend show that the measures are likely to be approved. The data apparently shows the effectiveness and safety of the vaccines in preventing severe illness in young children. Meantime, here in Kern, we got an update from KPH yesterday announcing 989 new positive cases and one new death attributed to COVID-19. The dashboard does show a slight increase in cases since our last update, with Kern County now averaging nearly 330 new cases a day. State data shows that we have 43 patients currently hospitalized in Kern County, and uh, we have five more in intensive care units. And we continue to follow some breaking news of a shooting near the Valley Plaza Mall. You are taking a live look at the scene. Police say a man was shot in the area just after 1.30 this morning, and he was taken to the hospital with life-threatening wounds. Police say they are still trying to find the shooter, and we are still working to get more information on the shooting, and we will update you as soon as we learn more. But again, this happening near the Valley Plaza Mall, this shooting around 1.30 this morning, a man who was shot with life-threatening wounds. 5.34 is our time. Now in 17 News is your local election headquarters, and it has been one week since voters in Kern and across the state voted in the midterm primary. Our elections department has been under scrutiny from some residents who want to ensure the process is accurate and safe. 17's Maddie Gannon has more. 
Good morning, Chairman Scrivener and distinguished uh, board members. I am Vince Mayoko. Exactly one week from California's midterm primary election, a group of residents in Kern, many belonging to the Election Integrity Project, returning to the Board of Supervisors floor. I am here as an advocate for election integrity, and I've had some serious concerns regarding the Kern County Election Office. A large issue EIP had with previous elections springing back up. And the biggest part of the process is the signature verification of a voter's ballot envelope. Kern County EIP coordinator Tom Pavich saying in the recall observers could watch the signature check process from one foot away. But for some reason the elections office uh, department decided this year to change that situation. We're now seven and a half feet. Kern Registrar of Voters Mary Bedard responding, saying the distance is less than six feet. You have the, the monitor with the screen, you have the worker uh, sitting behind the, the screen doing the signature checking, then there is the, the glass partition, and then there is the uh, the observer sit directly behind that. Bedard's announcement, Kern still has about 60,000 ballots left to count, becoming another point of contention. A lot of ballots still have not been counted. I mean, the numbers really haven't changed a lot. Taft Republican Assembly President and EIP volunteer Vince Mayoko raising issue with what he considers the slow counting of ballots in Kern, re-sparking the group's months-long argument that the position that runs Kern's elections should be split from the auditor controller duties. I mean, this is probably example number 952 of why that position needs to be decoupled from the auditor auditor, controller, county clerk position. Maddie Gannon, 17 News. Meantime, Kern County voters will get the chance to weigh in on term limits for county supervisors. A group of activists and organizations were uh, called We Are Kern County kicked off a campaign in March in hopes of in limiting Kern supervisors to two terms or eight years in total. Currently, there are no limits to how long supervisors can sit on the board. Four of the five have served at least eight years, with the longest being Mike Maggard, serving 15. Mary Bedard said she has verified the 26,000 signatures required to put the term limit proposal up for a vote. Current residents will take up the issue in November. Making news around the nation this morning with primary season in full swing. Elections officials say they're short a crucial supply. There might not be enough paper to go around. CNBC's Elon Mui reports. American democracy. It's rooted in life, liberty, and the pursuit of paper. Paper's always been a key part of an election. There are the ballots, of course, but that's just the beginning. Or a lot of it is precinct guides. Where are the, the precincts if you want to vote in person? Where can you drop your ballot off if you have drop boxes? Um, and then there's the voter registration information. People that move to a new state, want to mail in a voter registration application or get a voter registration card. All of those things require paper today. Run Back Elections in Phoenix prints materials for elections across 23 states in the District of Columbia. It can use up to 60 rolls of paper a day, each one weighing 1,000 pounds. But getting that paper has become a huge problem, with mills stuck in supply chain bottlenecks. Prices are up nearly 40 percent compared to last year. Deliveries are often delayed. And Congress is warning the paper jam could undermine Americans' most basic right. I think what we can do best to avoid any worst case scenario is to make sure that no one waits too long to order their ballots because the worst case scenario would be you have a polling place that doesn't allow individuals to vote on election day. Already, Texas had to limit the number of voter registration forms it hands out because of the paper shortage. In Louisiana, officials had to start the hunt months in advance. They called every paper mill in North America, not just the United States, but North America. So my concern was if Louisiana is having a difficult time to meet the needs of our state, which doesn't have a lot of usage of paper ballots, then what may other states be experiencing as well? Now Louisiana's Secretary of State Kyle Ardwin is calling on the Biden administration to invoke the Defense Production Act to ensure U.S. paper mills can meet demand. Do we really want to create a supply chain issue or a ballot uh, issue if we can't get the supplies we need? We're digging a hole for ourselves uh, in questioning the, the, uh, the uh, election um, even before we get there. 
The big deadline is around Labor Day. That's when they need to have enough paper to start printing for the November elections. Right now, officials tell me they have just enough for what's been planned, but very little wiggle room in case something goes wrong. Back to you. As Elon Moody reporting. Now, the House committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol announced that it's postponing its second public hearing scheduled for this morning. The next hearing will take place tomorrow instead. The committee did not say why it was postponing this morning's hearing. The witnesses who were expected to testify at the hearing included Jeffrey Rosen, Richard Donahue, and Steve Engel. 540 now, and we have an update on the story we've been following for more than three years. The Tahone tribe finally has the green light to bring a resort and casino to Kern County. 17's Christian Galeno has more on the multi-million dollar project years in the making. The Tejon tribe is the only federally recognized tribe in Kern County. Health and housing support are two of the greatest needs that we are seeing our tribal members with. A third of the members are under the age of 18 and over half are living under the federal poverty line. Since we heard that the governor was ready to concur on the gaming compact, mm -hmm. I didn't realize I've been holding my breath for 10 years. Economic prosperity for the tribe will come in the form of the long-awaited 52-acre Hard Rock Casino and Resort, greenlit by Governor Newsom on Monday. I can go to Cabo San Lucas, I can go to Lake Tahoe, uh, all of these destinations that are typically associated with, uh, you know, uh, vacationing, but Kern County. Uh, is now going to be on that list. The $600 million project set to be built along Highway 99 near Mettler will bring about 2,000 jobs during its construction. After its grand opening, about 3,000 jobs will be available for tribe members and Kern County residents. We have a great local development agreement with Hard Rock International and the, and the Tahoe tribe. Uh, that is uh, about a $220 million value to Kern County over the next 20 years. A county sheriff and fire department substation will also bring the necessary public safety to the area. It's a tremendous opportunity for them, uh, for not only their people, but um, they have created a project that's going to be meaningful for us all. Outside of, of course, the actual venue is the opportunity for Bakersfield specifically to be opened and recognized recognized within California. It's also an opportunity to recognize the original stewards of the land amid an ability to correct historical wrongs. Maybe not so much a correction. We've lost too many people waiting for this. We've lost too many tribal members over the last 10 years waiting for this. I, I can't see it as a correction any more than I can see it as finally something that we've been patient coming through something that the community sees as right and the gov governor sees as right. For 17 News, I'm Christian Galeno. Now that compact heads to the state legislature for ratification and then once approved, Hard Rock says the entire process from groundbreaking to grand opening will take about 18 months. Working in the spirit of the Golden Empire, this is 17 News at Sunrise. The 17 News at Sunrise podcast is a production of KGET and Nexstar Media Group. For more on all of the headlines in today's show, head to KGET.com.